all, I just love skiing, like so much. There's nothing in the world that brings me more joy, ever. I'm scared to death right now, but I've got this. Like I know deep down inside, I'm capable of what I'm about to do. I felt like the rehab was pretty simple and straightforward and I learned how to appreciate my body and how to take care of it, what to eat and like to stretch. I was 18, so I felt like I was invincible at the time. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to the Athletic Stance Podcast, a skier's perspective with your host, yours truly, Scott Chrisman. In this podcast, I have made it my job to go out and interview skiers at the highest level of the sport, to explore their perspective on life, what shaped and influenced them to become the person they are, and a whole lot more. First, let's take a look at our sponsors, because without them, none of this is possible. Our first sponsor is Northwest Tech. If you haven't heard of them yet, you're missing out. They hand make customizable three layer outerwear to order in the Pacific Northwest. And that means you know that it keeps you warm, dry, and looking unique while you're sending it around the mountain. They've been generous enough to give me a coupon code for my listeners. Use the code AOS75 to get $75 off any custom piece of outerwear. Their site is in the show notes. This episode is brought to you by POC. POC makes the best helmets, goggles, and protective wear out there. They've been dedicated to protecting athletes since day one, and I wouldn't wear a different helmet, goggle, back pad, or hip pads. With their spin technology and VPD system, there are no other products on the market that are like it. Definitely go and check out POCsports.com and protect yourself today. TJ David, skier and uh, mountain athlete, and living in Aspen, Colorado for like seven plus years now. Um, definitely call that home at this point, or home base, or I don't think I'm going to be moving anywhere else anytime soon. Um, but uh, yeah, I grew up, you know, for the skiing side of things, I grew up on the East Coast. I was born in New Jersey. Um, kind of far away from like any like notable ski mountains, but um, like was fortunate that uh, my dad was pretty into skiing and he got me skiing at like three or four years old. And at this point, I've been skiing for I don't know like twenty seven years or something like that. Um, but like, thanks to thanks to him for getting me into it. Um, but we grew up skiing in Vermont primarily. Um, Sugarbush, Killington, kind of in like my, like when I was like 15, 16, 17, 18, Sugarbush and Killington, um, Mad River Glen, you know, you probably heard of some of these places. A lot of good skiers come out of, uh, the East Coast because conditions are a little bit less than ideal, but we learn how to use our edges on the ice. And, um, I don't know. I was primarily interested in mobile skiing when I was, younger and that kind of like um i think that like tight style that mogul skiers have their ability to maintain control um like has helped me as a skier um having that foundation like moving into the big mountain realm and and now like with a like hyper focus in ski mountaineering i think for me like there's that um kind of background and, and depth has been really helpful. Um, and occasionally I still try to get my bump skis out on, on, on the hill to rip some zipper lines, but not, not as much anymore. I prefer some little softer snow, easier on the body. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's kind of my background. Um, <laughs> just love to ski as a kid. Um, I went to college on the East Coast as well, and then after which I moved to uh, Utah for a few years and ended up in Aspen. That disciplined background seems to be a uh, kind of a standard in the professional skiers' uh, history. You know, there are some people <laughs> like Hadley 
and some other people who entered uh, the scene later on. But I definitely, I find that a lot of skiers started super young and like, same for me. I, I was so lucky that my parents, even though we lived in Boulder, uh, my parents were willing to drive and I grew up ski racing, but they were willing to drive a couple hours, um, to get me wherever I needed to go. And, uh, yeah, that, <clears throat> those disciplined types, uh, or sections of the sport, I think really breed a, give you a good technical background and give you a, um, it's a good segue into other parts of the sport. And I can definitely see yeah. how moguls, like you need a really tight core. You need to be right there. And I think, uh, you know, with your mountain running as well, I can totally see how the moguls and the mountain running, because you have to be so like, uh, posturally aligned, I feel like, oh, um, with every move you're making in moguls and with every move you're making in running, because if you're not, then you're going to be, you know, you're going to be hurting. So, um, yeah, man, it's cool to hear the story and how it, how it developed. Where did you live in Utah when you lived there? I lived a season in Sandy and then another season in Cottonwood Heights. Um, skied out of like Alta primarily a little bit of snowbird, but mostly, mostly Alta, you know, but like that place changed my like perspective on, on like skiing and I had. I've uh, been fortunate to spend like a bunch of time in Colorado when I was like 19, 20, um, and had like, did, had some like cool big mountain experiences with skiing backcountry and, and like, even though I was living on the East Coast, kind of had a bit of, uh, opportunity with, uh, friends and family who were like already out here that were like willing to go skiing with me. Um, like spring break from school or like holidays, whatever. Um, and then as soon as I got there, I realized like, Hey, I have like a bit of a foundation and then like the sky is really the limit here. Once you kind of like get like a bit of avalanche education and like all the other stuff that goes into like skiing backcountry lines, but like just skiing the resort there is like a place that's huge. You I still to this day, I roll up in the parking lot. On Alta and look up at like High Boy, and I'm like, that's that's what a mountain should look like, you know. That's there's like vertical relief there, and like that's a six ski area for sure. And every time I try to still go back like once a year, I missed this year, I went last year. Um, but uh, that place where you can hone your skills there, I think for me, that's when I like got into like, okay, I should like pretty good at this, like, I can ski fast. I'm, I'm young. I feel like, um, indestructible. I can, I can jump off cliffs and land them. So I should do some free ride competitions. And then like, you know, things kind of took off, uh, skiing wise for me at that point. Um, what, was, what was it like coming over from the East coast to like you got to ski in Colorado a little bit, but then like to a place like Alta, that had to have been a pretty crazy contrast from like hanging on for your dear life on your <laughs> edges. And like when it's cold, I mean, I had a, a race out at Lake Placid, a white face. And I remember there was one gate where I was like standing on the gate inspecting. And I really like, it was probably like four feet of solid ice. I could see rocks underneath. And, uh, like I, I couldn't even like hold my edges while I'm trying to inspect on the, like, I'm just like yeah. watching the rocks go by underneath me. I'm like, what am I doing here? But I like, if you can, a, if you can have fun, but B, if you can hold an edge and like mm -hmm. be a decent skier out there, I think you pretty much are going to slay anywhere. Yeah, I think you're right. I don't know. I, I, <laughs> The thing is, like, the conditions can be so bad there, and you ski them anyways, because it's, like, maybe you spent, like, three hours driving to the mountain, and you're going to ski anyways, you know? Or So you get used to those conditions, and then all of a sudden you move to a place where it's, like, the baseline conditions are several levels above what you're used to skiing as your baseline conditions. And it's like, oh, like, a good day at Alta 
there's like pretty good chalk skiing, like buffed up west facing stuff. And you're like, I can ski really fast. Like I can, the snow is so much more trustworthy. Like it's more consistent. Uh, it's more confidence inspiring. Like all of a sudden you're like, I can look at what I can do. Like, this is so awesome. I didn't even realize that this was possible. Um, you know, like you get to Utah for your first time and you look up and you're like, like okay, you know, Colorado something like I, for me, it was like, oh, I've skied in Colorado quite a lot. Like there's some big stuff. Like I skied a lot in San Juan's, um, before I moved out here. Um, well, before I moved to Utah and then, yeah, you get to Utah and it, things are just bigger. Like there's less tree skiing. Like there's more, like things seem more exposed. <laughs> they're just a little bit more dynamic like it's so it's so cool and then having like this baseline of snow like all of a sudden you can start excelling like way faster than you were before and you're like oh <laughs> you know especially if you're skiing that country like it's kind of a, there's more risk involved and stuff so you need to be a lot more careful but that place, um, I think, is a bit different than other places, especially in the years that I were there, that really deep snowpack, like no like real persistent slab issues, nothing like that we have here in Colorado. And you maybe develop a, like a false sense of security about how you can ski backcountry lines there. Like my skiing style and the way that I approach the mountains then to now are like completely completely different um but it was it's like a great jumping off point i think um for someone who like moves to aspen for the first time from the east coast like i don't know if they would have maybe the same opportunity to develop like as a skier but of course it always depends on what your goals are with the sport where you want to like for how you want to progress um and for me it's like i sort of fell into the idea of wanting to like compete in free skiing comps because when I was like younger, I always followed like the free skiing world tour, like the Subaru uh, free skiing world tour and stuff. And I thought that that was cool. Like that those guys are on like another level of skiing and I would like to be on that same level. Um, so that was like kind of, and they, they did a good job of like getting content out there and making that available to people who are sitting in front of a computer on the East Coast, like watching a video while doing their like thesis in college or something. And it's like, that's what I want to do like in a year or whatever. Um, and I guess, yeah, I somehow made that happen. Uh, it was cool. Definitely, man. And that's where we ended up meeting each other. Um, right. yep. that, com that community was, and is, uh, I haven't been as close in touch with it, but the kind of, a lot of those connections when the free skiing world tour and free ride world tour merged that last season in Kirkwood, uh, when they did the combined event, um, a lot of those connections I have. I've made some really good friends from that year that have lasted a long time. And that community was and is amazing. Um, what, how did you first discover that online and were you in college writing your thesis? Probably, you know, like as far as I can remember, um, that's, yeah. I don't know. I was just into it. I followed it. I couldn't tell you how I stumbled upon it. Yeah. Um, you know, I think it was like skiing in, in Telluride a little bit um, with, uh, with my cousin and his friends. It was like, I knew of some athletes that were talked about. I skied with a couple guys like... Um, just like randomly um and was like okay like th th like this is like there's a scene out here like a free ride scene and um you know obviously i like watched ski movies like every kid grew up watching ski movies like warren miller um msp 
uh, all, you know, all that stuff. And, and like kind of crossed paths when I was like 18 and 19 with some of those guys, like in Telluride. And I think through that and seeing their level of skiing, I just was like curious. So I hopped online, you know, and you do a search and like, boom, there you are. Like, okay. Like you're, you're talking or you're chatting with them on the chairlist and they're like, yeah, we have a competition here, whatever it, in one month. Like, where are you competing? Oh, I'm not, comp- I don't compete. Like, I, you know, I, I do like a mobile, co- mobile competition, um, at the home resort in Vermont. Yeah. Like, but it's, um, I don't so know. It's really cool. I think the level of skiing back then, it was very different than kind of like where things, went like later on when I finally got into the tour for like four years or whatever. Um, way less of a, like a free style element to it and just a lot more, um, like technical, almost like very precise way of skiing. Um, you know, people might call some of that like billy goading and things like that, but like I love the precision and I think that was like kind of like, resonated a little bit with me because I feel like mobile skiing is very precise like that. Like you have to be completely dialed. Like you have to be owning like the tips of your skis the whole time. If you're, if you're not the the potential for like a disastrous crash is like huge, you know? Yeah. So, um, especially at those speeds with those obstacles and like those vertical lips and everything, you know? Totally. And then like you see guys who are doing that, you know, I remember watching like um, Griffin post like at CB, like basically just like so tight and like clean, but like the terrain is so incredibly steep. And it's like not that he's in a zipper line, but like the terrain is dictating to him in like what ways he has to like perform and move his body and, and like execute. And it's like very kind of similar um, because like the terrain of like a mobile course dictates to, to the skier, like how he needs to operate in that moment. Well, same with like skiing, like a steep technical line. Um, yeah. so like, I, I think I found parallels there that like really interest me, um, you know, like early on and like totally influenced me into like competition and getting like involved with the scene and like meeting guys like you and like Connery and other people who are um, like super involved in like totally crushing it, which was always uh, like inspiring and really cool to see. Like that was one of the best things about getting out there, like in the tour was just seeing what other people were willing to do. Like when conditions were like, "Eh, you know, I think in a day like today, I probably wouldn't be skiing normally, but okay. Like, competition day and like i enjoyed like my style is more to like take a step back and like not put myself out there um as much but i did enjoy like watching the skiers who were like really willing to do that and like is some super impressive uh like feats of athleticism uh and like so so much skill it's pretty amazing to see the level of competition. I definitely resonate with the whole like Billy goading style and like the origination. I live in Crested Butte now. So the yeah. extremes originated there with Shane and Brant and all those guys. And like, if you look at some of that old video, it is literally like just a, a steep face, like massive pillows and it's, yeah. it's super precision. And then like, sometimes you have like a little bit of a sketchy run out, but imagining like on the skis that they're on, or you have Brant moles just like boosting off stuff, you know, oh, just off. yeah, <laughs> yeah it's like the, the massive hip dump and, and everything. Um, yeah. but yeah, there's also like, there was a lot of precision, especially in some of those areas, like, slot rocks and it definitely uh i can see how that resonates and i can see when you say precision um a lot of those precision skills applying to the mountain running and the mountaineering because mountaineering you have to be very very precise with 
everything. It's not just your body. You have to be precise in your mind about what you're doing, what your plan of action is and, and everything. And so I can totally see how that precision has led to kind of a, a, the path that you are on today. Yeah, it's nice that you're just drawing a little parallel for me into what I've kind of like started to do more often now in the last like three years or four years. Um, yeah, I mean, I think you're really drawing a good parallel there. It's absolutely like ski mountaineering does bring like a level of precision, like, and that's kind of one of the most interesting things for me about, um, like the transition between like free ride and, and more of like this more calculated way of skiing, I guess you could say, like for me, it's not that, um, I don't enjoy like to go fast anymore or to like jump off big cliffs anymore. It's more of like the process that's behind, um, like in the, you have like a, like a peak or a line that you want to ski. And, and there's like this whole process involved with like figuring out what is, you know, the best route to get there. And like, and it's, a, I always like kind of think about it as a puzzle where you have all these pieces that need to be put together and you're not a hundred percent sure if they're all going to fit because you have such a big, like sometimes the goal can be really lofty. Um, but you say, Hey, you break it down and you make it seem more, um, obtainable by taking it one, like one piece at a time or one step at a time. So that way you're never completely overwhelmed by like the sheer magnitude of the whole thing at once. Um, and that's kind of something that I thought a lot about when I was in France last year for the first time skiing in Chamonix. Um, kind of like with, for the first time I like went from this like ski mountaineering thing to kind of dabbling more in like the ski alpinism thing, which is a, a different kind of realm where you're more involved with like much deeper climbing, much more variable conditions on the climbs. Like you're dealing with snow, rock, ice, um, and like a lot of exposure, um, all the time. And like, I think similar in a way to like free ride skiing where like you have your line and you, you visualize it like before and you know, like, okay, I make this turn then I'm going to take, then I'm, you know, that, then I'm going to get that first hit, land it, boom. Like those could be like three separate pieces right there, you know, like find your next takeoff, like land, like the next and the next, you know, you break it down. So like the whole thing doesn't seem overwhelming. And I think that, um, you know, everything like from, from where I first started with skiing, like to where that I am now, where I, I have much more of a focus on ski mountaineering and I'm trying to, uh, elevate that into more of like ski alpinism and like use my endurance to, um, ski like multiple lines of that nature in one, in one day or one push. Um, I think that it all kind of has like, taken roots in one place and then there's been a, a progression so to speak like on a larger scale um where like one thing has led to another and another like you don't just go from one place to another uh without like all the foundation and the like everything else that happens in the middle um i don't know it's uh kind of like for me that's like the ultimate thing. I think that defines like what life is for me, that it's a, a progression in a way. Um, and maybe like not always a puzzle, so to speak, but that it like you, you're constantly building on like experiences that you had before. And through those experiences, um, you're learning to like make the next decision and then the next one and the next one. And then all of a sudden you end up somewhere that you didn't even realize you're capable um, of ending up. 
And like, I think that's the most interesting thing. That's one of the things that I get the most out of skiing. That's probably why I still pursue like professional skiing. And, um, that's like the greatest outlet. I like the parallel, like skiing on a smaller scale for me, like is what life is in broader terms, really. Yeah. Um, and just a, like a smaller version of a bigger practice. I, I'm not sure if that makes sense. I'm a hundred percent. It makes sense to me. And I think it'll make sense to a lot of the listeners. I, I love how you call it a puzzle. Julian Carr calls it a project when he's lining up one of his flips or one of his, uh, you know, one of his massive cliff sends, he calls it a project. And I love how you, you say that, you know, you're creating a foundation. I think that, um, it's a lot like, building a house and sometimes, and it's also kind of like a puzzle, um, especially back to the mountaineering thing, because like one thing needs to fall into place and then another thing needs to fall into place. And then another thing, and you might not know what the conditions actually are until you make it to a certain point on the mountain. Sure. And then like you have to assess and that puzzle piece might not fit when you get there. Yeah. And then, and then you don't get to build on top of it until the next opportunity when the weather sets up again. And so it is, you know, like, uh, I think I love both of those analogies because you always need to be learning. And, and the more that you learn and educate yourself and practice skills, the more that you set a foundation, whether you know it or not. Yeah. So it's like, uh, you know, you or I wouldn't really have ever known that, the free ride competitions would lead us to where we're at right now. But we went out there and we created those foundations by putting ourselves in those situations and practicing those skills, Mm -hmm. whether it was performance in front of like other people, whether it was like networking, whether it was practicing our skiing skills. And so I totally get that resonation between, um, you know, skiing being uh, a practice that ends up, you know, mimicking the outside life as well. And I think like you can find that with yoga. I was having a conversation with a uh, yoga instructor, Sammy Asella last night. And she was talking about how like the practice on your mat is supposed to be a practice that uh, helps your outside life. And I think that Mm -hmm. skiing can become that meditative process and so can mountaineering. And I find so so many like metaphorical like overlaps or um you know if you want if you look at one thing there's generally so many things that tie it to other things Um, and i wanted to talk a little bit about you are moving in the same direction as um kind of chris davenport and you and chris are uh you know, you've been able to spend a lot of time around him. And I think that through that, I would assume, I don't want to make assumptions, but I would assume that there's been a lot of education and a lot of like, he's just a very wise person and he's been out there and done a lot. So, um, you know, being around, I think you've spent some time around Julian and you spent some time around Chris. So being around those, those people, um, and you referenced being around some of the pros earlier, I think putting yourself around those people can really benefit you. Can you speak to how like you formed those relationships and like, it might've been something where you were setting a foundation that you didn't even know or something? Um, uh, yeah. I mean, I guess like, in terms of, um, you know, like my relationship with Dav is he, you know, he owns Kessley. He's a part owner in Kessley and I ski for Kessley. So, you know, it's kind of, it's, he's, it's nice. Like he's a, like an incredible resource, like, especially for the industry. Um, he and both Griffin are great resources, but, uh, having Dav like in Aspen is, is pretty cool. Um, although he like, he's very much involved with his, uh, kind of guiding business and he's traveling a lot. I have been, I guess, lucky to get out, like, and do some photo shoots with him and to work on, like, we worked on a pretty cool project, 
Um, was it last year? Hold on, let me check here. I think it was, yeah, 2016. We did, um, like, our mutual friend, Jesse Hoffman, is a cinematographer and photographer here in Aspen. And he got involved with this Red Direct um, film competition. And he was working with Dav and some other uh, athletes, whatever, in town to, like, do this backcountry film project. And kind of, like, right time, like, right place, right time, I was... Dad was like, you should come out with us and ski. Um, like, we're going to do this ski mountaineering segment. And I was like, okay, this is really cool. Like, I'm, I'm definitely going to go. So, like, we hung out um, in uh, one of the 10th Mountain Huts and did, like, a really early start. Um, got up on one of on Star Peak, which is kind of, it's not far from Crested Butte and it's not far from Aspen, kind of like right there in the middle. Yep. And it's a line that I've skied probably like three times, at, two or three times at that point and has a beautiful, like steep, um, North face, like I don't, maybe 45 degrees or something like, not like ridiculously steep, but like kind of like perfect aesthetic for filming. And we skied, like we climbed the knife ridge and summited me and Dav and two other guys. Um, and this like wasn't the first time that I was like really getting out with, uh, with Dav, but like it was the first time like we'd done like some mountaineering together and like it was kind of, um, awe inspiring to like one see like how fit he was. Like he has like this lifelong fitness that he's developed and you can just see that. And it's like, it's like a mental, physical, like there's this confidence, like this assuredness. Um, you can tell like he's completely in his element when he's out there. And, um, that's like a bit contagious. Like his whole vibe is, um, like you can really like pick up on that and like it brings an energy to the moment. And, uh, it was quite, a, it was like a really cool experience for me to do that project because we actually like, we got to the summit of the peak and the line looked like it was in good condition. So he hadn't been there before. And, and like, I thought we had like a pretty good rapport because I had been there. I'd skied the line. Um, I knew like I had good data on, on like the approach and everything. And like, I thought we had like a good rapport, like someone like dad could easily be like, this is how we're going to do it. Like, and I, ha cause I have 40 years of, you know, not, well, oh, almost 40 years, maybe now, like he's probably been skiing for at least 40 plus years and mountaineering for 30 years. Like he has so much experience. He could easily have dictated like the whole situation. Um, but like, I thought that he's like very humble and, and was like really engaging. Um, which for me, was like really cool because it's not like we were just out doing a photo shoot, make a turn here, make a turn there, ski, ski over there. It's like, we were in real terrain, you know, with real consequences. And, um, you know, also it was kind of one of those situations where like, one person's going to get to ski this line. It's going to be maybe the best shot in the entire film for like aesthetic Barbie, like, like pretty much as, as good as it gets, you know? And like, it was cool having had been there to like help present like what I thought would be like a good way of doing it. And then I was just trying to set dad up for like, so he could ski it, you know? And then he let me ski it. And I was like, wow, this is, I was blown away by that. Like I couldn't, you know, because the film was more not about me. I was involved with it, but like the film was about him or whatever, like or at the time that was going to be the idea um, in the way that I understood it. And like, yeah, it was a surreal experience. And then we, I skied the line and it went really well. And then, we went, you know, he skied off to the side and like we ended up going back up and skiing powder on, in another North facing couloir. And like, 
I got to see like in that moment, it was like, I got to see like, he still rips. Like yeah. if he wants to rip, he can like rip and he's like incredible. Like there's a reason why he's been so successful in his career. It's not that he can just transcend from free ride, ski mountaineering to guiding to being like an ambassador and an owner. Um, but like you can see right there in the way that he skis, like that, that confidence isn't just like it goes from, from skiing to everything else. Um, and that's pretty impressive, you know, and I think for me having like done some shoots with him and stuff for Aspen Snowmass, um, and the more that I like get to ski with him, I, I realize like some things that are like really important in skiing, like longevity is really important like picking and choosing like the right moments to ski hard and fast and to like put it out there and then knowing the right moments to, to hold back and to be patient. And um, yeah, I think he's a great example of all of those things because he's in his mid forties now and he's still like a very relevant figure in skiing and he's still by far even though he has other pursuits like guiding and and all of that, which uh, I think is is awesome, he could still be and is like a relevant athlete, and f- and I think that that's like that's huge. Like that shows somebody like me who has is kind of like progressing with you know partnerships with brands and like. I, I'm still like involved because I love it and I'm not like making tons of money. Um, but I can see like, if you're patient enough, if you play like the long game, there's no limit. Like you don't die. Like you're not going to decline as an athlete. Like he's yeah. the perfect example that you don't yeah. decline. You can only get better and more experienced. And like the sky is really the limit. If you're willing to like, put aside like some short term, like goals that you want to get accomplished rather wait for kind of these opportunities to come over time with patience. That's probably the the biggest thing that I get from skiing with, uh, with somebody like him, you know, in terms of like Julian Carr, um, I actually don't know Julian like that well. Um, we worked, uh, like a little bit with discreet and stuff, Um, but like, I appreciate his perspectives on like mindfulness. I like his, I I draw parallels to the fact that he likes this like state of, um, like calmness when he kind of does his huge, uh, like soaring cliff jumps and things like that. And for me that like indirectly, like is a, is like a teacher of some kind of practices. Like sometimes that reminds me of the importance of like when I'm skiing, like I never want my heart rate elevated. I don't listen to music that pumps me up. I like, maybe I don't even listen to music anymore. Um, I like to be very centered all the time. And that's something that he talks about. I've listened to him or read things that he's, um, you know, posted or written about. And I think that's fundamental. That was one of the things for me that like, I noticed my best performances, like in the, like on the tour, free free skiing or whatever, um, was when I was so calm and like had had like great visualization before. That's when I executed the best. And I, and I think like, I've taken those same mentalities and used them with ski mountaineering. Um, and like in a recent thing last, last week we skied Pyramid Peak, um, myself and Chase, my buddy Chase Bronze. So we skied, uh, the Landry line, which is, you know, dad's written about it, uh, like 50 classic North American descent. So, you know, that's a line that I wanted to ski for a long time. I think it's probably, about the only thing that we have in Colorado that feels like a line from the Alps. I mean, it's big, um, a lot of vertical relief and, and like 
tons of exposure and it involves like quite a bit of like actual mountaineering um and and like a really fun like dynamic approach and really dynamic ski and i posted a video online um you know skiing kind of above some exposure and some people had asked me and like other sponsors reach out to me to say what's your mindset in that situation like how, what are you thinking um and it's exactly kind of what julian was talking about in your podcast like yep and it's something that i have talked about a little bit before um in another interview but it's like you recognize like what's at stake you understand like what happens if you can't execute what you're doing um like that's very real that's right in front of you uh but the the idea is you don't grasp at that like you don't grasp that at all you understand it you accept that but you don't let that dictate to you how you're going to perform in that moment you you find rather you find your center you find the moment right there um and when you and i think for me it's like when my breathing is calm when my mind is clear um there's absolutely no question in my mind that i can ski anything and will not fall if if, the, if i'm in that mindset that's it like i have the incredible confidence in my ability um and I won't start skiing until I feel like I'm there. Yep. There's, you know, and, and, so, and that can be tough sometimes, you know, like for example, a line like pyramid skiing, Landry line. Um, it took me three times to ski that. It took me three times to ski that because one time I didn't like the snow. It was like too isothermic. It wasn't getting a good freeze. And like, that's a part of the puzzle. Like when you're up there, if you're not, into the snow conditions and you're about to drop in on an east facing line that gets sun starting at 6 a.m you're not feeling that if the snow isn't showing you that you know today's the day boom you go home like you you could maybe force it and get it done but that's not to me like that's not to me like skiing like skiing and, and mountaineering is like completely being in uh, in the flow of that moment and in like almost being sounds like a little, I don't know, cliche maybe, but being one with that moment, you know, if one piece is fitting and the next and the next and the next, you're in that flow and then you're continuing on. Um, so, you know, I've had a situation where the snow wasn't good. And like, so we bailed, um, in that same day, somebody else skied it. And, and like that, I questioned myself for a moment, like, hey, maybe I, we could have gotten this thing done today. And that was after an hour plus on a bike, right, you know, going up Maroon Creek Road, several hour like approach in, in what I would can have considered bad isothermic snow, like to like basically from like 4 to 6 a.m. sleeping at 12,000 feet waiting for light so I could ski back down. You know, it's like a huge commitment if you leave your house after maybe, I think at that point it was like when the times that I tried it before, it was after work, you know, working till 11 at night, coming home, getting my bike, meeting a partner, going to the trailhead, riding for an hour, skinning and climbing for three hours and then bailing. Like that's tough. Like on your, you know, mentally that can be exhausting. Yeah. Um, but like the whole process is like when you finally, when those pieces finally align and then you end up in that moment and like you've had the experiences of like not getting it twice, you know, like how to be prepared for that. And so like, it, you don't like everything seems just like methodical and meditative and like you feel so like in tune with that moment and like when this was just a week ago so it's like my most kind of recent um experience that i can like speak on but like having gotten up onto that ridge and seeing like how much more we needed to climb but how much time we had how well we had set ourselves up for like success that day uh it was like for both of us we were like 
the puzzle pieces were like we had had the foundation that was like all the preparation for that like the past experience being early like knowing the the route really well um being you know and then it was like what was the next piece it's like how's the snow are we you know are we fast enough all this stuff and you get to the top you you finally realize you're going to ski the line you take a few moments to collect yourself um kind of in a similar way that you know julian was talking about like totally focused like very calm um and then there's no doubt in your mind like you're prepared and you know you can execute that and i think for me, like that's kind of the ultimate thing. And like, it's that whole process that takes place that makes like that whole thing exactly what it is. And it's like, boom, this is why I'm going to try to, you know, like bring that to my next like idea of what I'm going to ski or to that next like line that I'd like to do or whatever. Definitely. Yeah. There's so many things that I want to talk about with that. Uh, the, one of the things that came to mind for me and when you're talking about Chris and, and, uh, always making the best decisions and that it took you three tries to get that line. It's like something that I'll probably coin this quote and make a little quote card out of it. Uh, the best make the best decisions. And that's like you, we always want this instantaneous grad, uh, gratification in society right now. At least that's where the mindset is trending towards is in- instantaneous gratification and um, being able to put minimal work to accomplish maximum results, right. maximum <laughs> results. But I think that there is inherently, you have to go through a process to get real results, results that you feel inside of you and results that you actually get to celebrate and like you get to resonate with there Mm -hmm. is a process and you have to go through work or at least show up for that process every step of the way and i think like showing up for the process can be climbing it twice and making that decision not to you know because that is the process that is where the universe is guiding you to be in that moment and you have to be meditative about it and kind of surrender to the idea that you are trying to put something out into the world, but that the universe is going to guide you to the, the place that you're supposed to be if you pay attention and if you have awareness about it. Absolutely. <laughs> I laugh because I, I completely agree with what you're saying and I don't have enough conversations with people who think in a similar way is, is that, um, but it's, uh, I, I completely agree. I think, I think in life in, in, a, in a lot of situations, there, there are like all sorts of different like outcomes that exist out there. And depending on like what you decide to do, uh, you meet like a potential like future on, um, and like for something like ski mountaineering, I guess, uh, it, like there's so many uncertainties, especially when you're skiing, like, um, a bigger line, you know, like a bigger test piece, something where you're like stepping your level up just a little bit in order to continue to progress yourself. Um, you don't know like necessarily what the future outcome is like you understand like there are all of these things that could possibly happen and if you force that any one of those things that you like maybe your ego dictates to you that you need to have like have happen like i need to ski this because it looks really good on my resume and if i don't do it this year maybe i'm not gonna like get like more money from sponsors or something like there's some things to be thought about. And so when you have these like possible, like future outcomes, um, and, and you're too involved in thinking about those or like forcing something to happen, I think you actually lose sight of like what you're, what you're really doing, what the real purpose is, like why you're actually out there. And like, in terms of like instant gratification, um, I see this a lot, like quite honestly, I think in this industry, social media makes a lot of this stuff like really prevalent. Um, 
somebody sees that I skied the Landry line. Cool. Like a lot of people have skied the Landry line. Like that's a prominent line. It's been written about, um, it's well known, but I put, I put something out on social media and somebody else without having 10 years or more of experience in skiing, uh, and, and ski mountaineering could go and try it and maybe ski it because it's not impossible to be done. And quite frankly, I think anybody with the proper preparation and experience level could do it. Uh, but it doesn't mean like maybe they did it and they just got away with it because it's like one of those situations in skiing where it's like a numbers game. And like, as someone who's focused and thinking about longevity, like you look to mitigate like all of those things that put the odds against you. You don't want to just get away with anything. You want to feel good at the end of the day that you made the right decisions. And I think, you know, people do reach for like instant gratification. It reminds me a little bit of um, like, I don't, have you read uh, the Dow 365? It's uh, like a book on kind of like, it's a book written by um, like a sage who like for each day of the year, has like a Taoist um, like story to relate to the reader on like how it is to live kind of like in this thing called the Tao or like in this flow. Yeah, um, I have not read that book. It's really cool, man. You might find it um, interesting. Like, it's I love practical. books. I love reading. I love practical advice. So I will definitely get get on that for sure i'll I'll send it to you i'll send you uh like a link to it after but um so like this instant gratification thing this guy he wants he he's he's walking around in in china and he sees like this amazing house it has like five floors and it's beautiful like roof like top like terrace or whatever and so he's, he's got a lot of money he's like a wealthy dude and he tells um this worker like hey I want this house. I want the exact same house that this other guy has. And so every day he, he goes to the worker. What's the deal? Why isn't, why isn't my house built yet? Guy, it, well, I have to first build the foundation. Comes back the next day. Why isn't my house built? Well, I have, you know, like I have to then build this, the first floor. Comes back again, like, I don't understand. This guy has the whole house. Where's my house? Like I'm paying you all this money. And the guy says to him, you know, in in some words kind of similar to this, but he says like, you know, you're so fixated on the end result. You're so fixated on having like that fifth story or whatever, like that terrace up there. You forget that I can't build the house without like a solid foundation, without the first, second, third, with all the floors in between. Um, and I think like people in general and something that I try to think about and like how I've kind of like where I draw like the parallels between skiing and, and like how life evolves is like what we were talking about before, where you have like a foundation and then you you're continuing to build on this progression. Like you can't expect to have everything right away. You can't expect to have like this amazing rooftop patio penthouse deal without having made like all the steps in between that get you there. Um, Yeah. You can't enjoy the sunset from the top until the house is fully built. Right. And it seems so like simple. The concept of that is so like simple, but people, um, tend to not understand that. And I think like guys like Chris Davenport, people like Julian Carr, um, other like very successful athletes in across like all sports, I think in some way understand that concept. And I, and I would go as far to say as a lot of people who have had success in whatever it is that they do at some level understand that concept. And I think that that's incredibly important um, and something that I love to talk about because that's 
every day you're, you're gaining an experience, whether it relates to skiing or for me for trail running or skiing or whatever. Um, some you're, you're building just a little bit in small steps to get to somewhere where you didn't think you could possibly be. For example, I remember three years ago being on the top of Aspen, we had this like telescope Landry line is right there. Just looking at it. I would never ski that. I told a friend like, no, why would I ever do that? That's totally insane. And then at uh, some point there I am standing there, you know, and that's, and I'm right where I'm supposed to be based on like everything I did before that. And that to me is a really like beautiful part of like life and living like my life through like this smaller lens of skiing or whatever. Yeah. Things, like other roles that I play. I love that. I think, you know, being able to be in your journey, wherever your jo- your journey is and lit like embodying that process and being in the now is very much that flow that you're talking about that Tao <laughs> state where you are able to realize that one step leads to another leads to another. And exactly what you're saying, where one thing, if you are just spending time in awareness of the now, then you're going to get places, even though you may not see the places that you're going to get. And so many people go the opposite direction where they want to know exactly where they're going to get and also how they're going to get there. And I lived with that for a long time. And it was like, as soon as I released the idea of uh, owning the whole process of how to get there and trying to make it happen now, as soon as I released all of that and was like, okay, universe, where like, I see you're trying to push me in certain directions, like with this podcast. And you know, like, um, I, I can see that there are things that (laughs) you're making easier for me and things that you're making harder for me. And so instead of fighting all the hard stuff over here, if I just take a step back and realize that I can probably get on top of the mountain, but instead of climbing up the 90 degree face, I can walk around, spend a little bit more time building a foundation and be at the top, uh, walking on a 25 degree pitch the whole time, you know, it's just like smart. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. That's the way to go about things. I think in in many, many cases, um, yeah, I I like, you know, for me, I like talking about that because I draw a lot of parallels to, to my life through skiing in that, in that manner. Um, And I I don't know, I kind of hope like some of the younger guys coming up in Aspen, like I want to kind of, I hope they can in their own journeys, like figure that out for their own like sake of longevity and not um, unnecessarily like pushing things to places where they don't need to necessarily go. Um, I like, I like, uh, we have so many good skiers here. Um, so and many good like, skiers. Like the talent level is ridiculous. Um, you know, but I, I think that being like having been doing this for 10 years or something like that at this point, like seriously, like as an athlete, I think for me, it's if I could pass anything down to somebody, it would be like, you know, focus on like, continuing to build like your foundation and like longevity like skiing isn't something that like you're just doing right now for like a few likes on instagram like if you really like skiing you're you're going to do skiing forever so how do you do skiing forever you know it's it's making like smart decisions based on you know past experiences um and, and like a lot of people talk about failure in skiing which I find off-putting a little bit because like as a ski mountaineer, uh, I'm used to going and doing stuff and bailing like a lot. Um, And I have no issue with that. And I don't consider that like being comfortable with failing. I don't consider that to be failing at all. 
it's 100% success because you're making the best decisions all the time. And it's not about ego. It's not about checking it off the list. It's about being in the now and interacting with the environment around you the way that you should making the right decision based on the, uh, external world, you know? Yeah. Sorry. I jumped in on that, but yeah, no, like, I think that, um, I think you're totally right. And I think that also society like dictates to people. What is the, like, what is like this societal like vision of success and what is it of failure? And you have these two very opposite things. But in reality, I don't necessarily think that one is different from the other. I don't necessarily think one is success and one is failure or there's a reverse, like an inverse of the two. I think that they're both different outcomes of something that you wanted to achieve and that need like I'll, I'll use the py- uh, pyramid Landry line again as an example, like tried to ski that twice, like quote unquote, failed twice. But I thought that those were not failures because I learned so much from them. They were only positive experiences. If something's positive, why would you put like a label like fail on that? Like, why would you even say like TJ is really comfortable with failure because he turns around from lines like all the time? Yeah, it's, it's like, like, no, it's not failure. I'm you know, comfortable with really, making the best decision. <laughs> no, it's, exactly. Like I'm comfortable with making the decision that isn't going to give me the outcome that I like hoped for in the best case scenario. Like the one that I visualize like occurring, but it's not, it's not a failure because I learned like an incredible amount from that it's only positive that only led me to like being able to do it sometime later, a year later. Um, and the same thing with success, like, because I did it, does that mean I was successful? Like, sure. Like society might define success as something like that. But the fact that like I did it doesn't necessarily mean it was success. Like, because from like, right there when you think about like the whole concept concept of success it's like what is success like it's positive like why was it positive like because you did something that you that took like many steps in a row to get to like all sorts of different things that built up to it like no it was it was the process that made it what it was it wasn't never the success of it it was like having not been able to achieve like the ultimate like goal that was like what you know fueled another attempt and like but you know i don't think about it as like success i think about it as like just another like experience that i had that's going to allow me to do something more later yeah so like so like both of them are learning experiences both of them are positive and like if you dwell on like too much of the negative, which I feel like a lot of people get in these mindsets where they, they will really harp on like not having succeeded in something and it will totally um, shape like their immediate next decisions or like, or like a really interesting emotional reaction to what occurred or like some kind of like drive to do something more. Um, but maybe like it was so emotional that they weren't able to like fully like come about in a way to grasp like what actually they just needed to do something a little bit differently. I don't know. Uh, For me, I think like skiing like pushes at all of those emotions, especially ski mountaineering because you constantly, or at least I do, set to push myself like a little bit in my boundaries. Um, I don't like to overstep because I never want to feel like I just got something done for the sake of doing it. I prefer to like feel like I'm inside of myself, like ability wise and just pushing that like skill set to the next level. Um, in such a slight way that like I continue my own progression in the sport. Um, 
And like, for me, that has a lot to do with like, not worrying about if I like get the line or not, like not worrying about like, I went to Chamonix and this year really hoped I skied the North face of the Aguida Midi. Like that was something that like internally I really wanted to do. Like for me, I wanted to ski like this was the year I wanted to ski like Mallory route. Uh, no, I didn't do it. Like it wasn't like the condition wasn't good when I was there. Um, so I could leave having that been like the, the one thing like I really wanted to accomplish. I could have left that whole trip feeling like complete crap because I didn't do it and, and forgotten about like all of these other like super cool ski experiences that I had that will probably eventually allow me to ski that line anyways. Um, totally dude i i love that and i love because you spoke about the attachment the awareness versus attachment when you were talking about skiing the landry line and being over exposure and being aware that there's danger but not being attached to that outcome and being fully confident and in yourself aware of your ability to accomplish it and so um there's also this attachment that you get on the other end where you can get really attached to the positive outcome. So that's the negative outcome that you're trying to stay away from, but you also need to be aware of. And then there's this positive outcome that you're trying to pull towards you and, you know, be aware of. And there's a lot of the time I, you know, like you said, in social media with that instant instant gratification, um, like we have, there's a lot of the time that people don't necessarily make the best decision because it is an emotional based decision. It is like, I want to do this because I want to say that I could do it or I want to check it off on the list or, or whatever it is. And I definitely, I've been going through this, um, to revert back to stuff you said a little bit ago is I've been going through this big phase of realizing that, failure failures or like everything that's been bad in my life isn't actually bad. And I actually like wrote a post on Facebook yesterday that was poetry. I've never, like I've never posted poetry on Facebook, but it was basically the idea that like, uh, there is no good without bad. There is no life without death. There is no love without loneliness. Like there are all of these things must exist in harmony in one, which I think is so much about what you're talking about where, Um, you have to sit in the balance of want action and accomplishment and like not, you know, not need any of it too much, but put yourself there to accomplish it. You know, it sounds like you're thinking about like transcending, like the dualities that exist in life, you know? And I think that's a cool concept in itself. Um, that in fact, like, I believe that you're totally right about that. Like you can have good and bad or whatever. Uh, but there is something in the middle actually, that is all of that holds it all together. And that's, I think at face value, people see one or the other. Um, especially like if they're thinking very emotionally, uh, and then they miss, something that might actually be more more worthwhile to see right there uh, if they have a little bit of a different uh, way of thinking maybe it's crazy because we are innately experiential beings through our evolution we were just experiential a lot of the time and then we've kind of mm-hmm. developed this higher level of thinking so then it's like interfacing that higher level of thinking with the experiential like just in the moment this feels good or this feels bad you know right. because then you get to pull yourself back because of the like the, <laughs> the frontal cortex and like that higher level of thinking mm-hmm. you get to pull yourself back from being in the now and see perspective and that's sure. so crazy just having a little <laughs> philo- philosophical tangent <laughs> that's okay but, but yeah man I, I i definitely think that being able to have that perspective and being able to understand that like there really isn't such a thing as failure there's only things that are leading you towards the next thing that's you know gonna happen right. in your life which might be like leading you towards success 
Um, but like if you can remove the frame of failure or bad being a thing, like I literally have been able to remove that from my way of thinking because it, a, it doesn't serve me, but B like I have so many experiences in the last two years that have shown me like breaking my back led me to good things. Tearing my ACL led me to good things. Getting in trouble with the law led me to good things. Like all these, you know, it's like, and a lot of it also was a choice. So like a lot you're saying about mindset, there's a choice to, to have a negative mindset. And then there's a choice to like take a step back and try and look for the good. I think that choice is a very, very powerful one. Just like you're saying the choices that you make are based off of longevity, that those are very powerful choices. Uh, yeah, hundred percent. Absolutely. I, I think that your, your perspective is a very evolved perspective. I think that if something like that was taught to people in school, instead of many other things that could possibly be considered useless, people would more or less find more enjoyment and fulfillment in, in their lives, which is, um, not to continue on a philosophical conversation, but let's I think go for that, it. Send it. That's obviously very, uh, that's a very important thing, you know, like, and, and to go back to success and failure, um, people's happiness is directly related to their experiences with success and failure and how those successes and failures really relate to, um, what their expectation is for themselves and for other people around them. And I think it creates, unfortunately, like an unhealthy balance for some people. And maybe that's why people feel unfulfilled or unhappy. Um, you know, I'm not a spitting example of any of the things that I've talked about. Uh, I try to practice them as best that I can, you know, throughout yep. life. And that's, uh, for me, like involves like a lot of practice and like awareness and, and trying to like understand myself and my own decision making and not like, not so much that like I have been trying to like grasp like everything about me that like, is this like very complicated, like thing of evolving, uh, different ideas and perspectives but it's to like, at least at some fundamental level, kind of figure out what like my core belief system is, or so to speak that like, so that when I'm in a place where I need to make a decision, like I understand where that decision comes from. And like, I don't have to like second guess it, you know, cause that's, I think that's the worst. I think for skiers, um, you know, for skiers, especially ski mountaineers who you can end up in like these like precarious situations in these places where like perhaps you need like a huge skill set to get yourself out of it because you've ended up there somehow in like this series of decisions. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh my God, I'm in this closeout line in an ice chimney and if i can't put this v thread in i can't repel out of here and like whatever and if you know it's like that kind of stuff it's like you need to be able to have this awareness and for me like it, my way of figuring out like how to be aware of myself in those situations and to only put me try to put myself in places that i feel comfortable in is through spending time with myself. Like for me, like we'll go to trail running for a moment. For me, like trail running is like my, one of my favorite things to do because it gives me a chance to, um, like do active meditation, um, where I can like either be in complete calmness, like these like really like powerful and like total like runner's bliss situations. Um, I can be on the very opposite end of that uh, spectrum where I'm in like intense moments of like very, very powerful discomfort uh, and trying to work through that. Um, but in that process, like there's times where you, you come into like these thought processes um, on the trail where you start to like run through like 
these things about yourself, like you get information for, about yourself from other places. And I think that it's like the focus when I'm running, I'm so focused on my breath. Like a lot of, uh, a lot of runners train like with heart rate monitors, uh, to understand like where, what zone they're training in. Uh, and of course I do train with a heart rate monitor, but primarily I train like with an awareness of my breath as to understanding like what zone I'm in and what my like perceived like effort level is. Um, so like if I'm in these certain levels and if, like for me, it's like very, it's lower levels of breathing where like my breathing is completely calm. Um, so maybe for somebody that like translates into like a zone two or something. Uh, but that's where like, sometimes I get in the, like these head spaces where I can start to like go through some of these things that like we're talking about now or like other things that brings me to a higher level of awareness about myself. And like running is a great example of like an active way of doing that. But like, I love to also spend time in, in meditation to do the same thing. Um, or to like work through maybe like an issue I'm having in my life or um, a, something that's challenging me and I need to like go through some ways of like figuring out the situation um, in, in just a different space than like if I'm just sitting here right now talking to a friend or um, like thinking on my own uh i think like the your your breath to kind of go back to like how you feel like uh before you jump off a big cliff or drop into a line at a competition or ski whatever it is that you want to ski like it's not you don't get there by being pumped up you don't get there by having a high heart rate you don't get there by like hyperventilating you get there by like having this calmness um that's where like you're most clear that's where the most oxygen goes to your brain that's where things are like working in this like hyper state i the think most, it's homeostasis in your body i, I feel yeah, like absolutely and i think you know like you talk about or you have like i've in some of your other podcasts a lot about meditation and stuff and i think that meditation visualization um and like all of the different practices and ways of doing that um, are like clearly beneficial to the athlete. I think that it brings nothing but uh, positive results like in competition, training. It, it makes you, in, in fact, like the more you practice it, it, it will just change the way you interact on a daily basis uh, with people, um, you know. Another thing that should be taught to people at a younger age, I was like fortunate um, to start in those kind of things at like around 13 years old. Um, just kind of like as a, my neighbor was like into like alternative practices and helped me with some like anxieties I had um, as a kid. And like I always used those techniques like for like throughout my life um and then like as i got into like my mid-20s and started to like change the way i meditated and like instead of using like only active meditations um and visualizations i started to like turn more towards like longer periods of of deeper meditation um and i found those like to be like very um I'm trying to think of a, a good descriptor, but they, they, they were in, in their essence, like they really changed like my anatomy, um, as a person, like they made a huge difference. It was like beyond like wanting to perform well in an athletic event. It was like, how do I eat? Like they helped me to evolve. Like it was, I, I remember when I first got into that, like, I noticed the difference immediately. Yeah. I think it can change like the operating system for your brain almost, or it can kind of change like the algorithm of how you are balancing things in your life. When mm -hmm. you go that deep, you realize that like some of the things that you're attached to or placing value on may not be quite the, 
like what actually truly matters most to you. And sometimes I think when you sit in contemplation for that long or you move in contemplation for that long, then you, you start to find out these things where you're like, Oh, that like for right now, that is what I feel is a piece of me. And that can change, you know, but yeah, there's like, I I can totally understand that like deeper level of your like, Oh, I like, I really want to be in an MSP movie. This is one of the things for me. I really want to be in an MSP movie. And it's really not that big of a deal. If I have a lot bigger impact, if I can interview people like you and if I can start a podcast and, and be able like, there are different forms of media or different mediums that I can express myself that can have mm-hmm. just as much of an impact, if not more, because we actually get to speak right now about philosophical right. things. And the movies are amazing because they're visual and they capture your attention. But maybe mm-hmm. this hour and a half is so much more powerful than any ski movie for some sure. people yeah. to spend their time on. And I, um, I think for me, a big thing that I've learned recently is I don't need to quantify or qualify my impact in the world. I just need to be and go and do and like have the best intentions and then check in and make sure that like the results that are coming are, are what I want and what I like feel I want to see in the world. But you know, it's like, it's, I don't need to know that I've helped a million people or whatever. It's just like, I can go out and help and serve and talk to and be with people throughout the day. And you never know what a smile or a wave or helping someone across the street, whatever it is, you don't need to know what that impact is and you can detach your ego from it. You can just go and be and do and have and be happy, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think the smallest interaction can even be um, downplayed as nothing um, or considered like random coincidence in a way. I think that everything that is occurring has some kind of underlining significance, even if you don't realize it at first, like you were talking a lot about how earlier you you had a series of things like that, maybe like on paper are perceived as like as bad, but then they led you to like what you're doing now and like this change of lifestyle and and like adopting like these new things and and so like if that's what led you to like this amazing place that you're that you like are in now they could never be considered like bad like they were just if you link them together like these series of like coincidental things that occurred they're actually they're not really coincidence at all like at all. they are, they are the way things are supposed to be. They and were the foundation for now. Correct. They are like, the foundation that's for now. Cool. If you can, and like without like over analyzing any of it, because I don't know how well that serves, but being aware, being aware that like some situation like that could, and you don't know when it's going to come back to you, but if you have the right mindset and, and you try you don't just try, you do. You just say, I am taking this moment as like, you know what, I'm going to get, I'm getting something good out of this. I don't know what it is today in this moment exactly, but I'm getting something good out of it. And you bring a little faith to it. Like it, it does work. It works out. And like, boom, you know, like you're, you know, reaching people through a podcast and, and other stuff. And I think that that is, um, like really valuable. I think that's very cool. I think definitely. And I think you can relate it to that suffering that, um, like on the side of a mountain, sometimes you're suffering and you don't know why you're there or what the purpose (laughs) is. And sometimes you need to turn around and you don't know why, and you you're angry and you're attached to the outcome. And like, then you just need to show up for yourself again and show up for those emotions and be like, okay, I understand you. I'm here for you. Like, even talking to the emotions, I want to be like, okay, I like, I'm here for you. I don't know why you're here. I don't know why we're feeling so much pain right now. And I think, uh, along with the running and that can even apply to some of these emotional experiences with like 
losing friends or being put in situations where <clears throat> you're in trouble with the law and your self-esteem is, you know, out the yeah. window and, and everything. And, you know, being able to just be like, okay, it's okay to be here right now because I can make the, like, I can make the decision to try and go out and do good and become better, even mm -hmm. though uh, I'm not like, uh, I don't know why this pain is here, but I can accept it to get to feeling good, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It's very cool. If you could have, and this is a big one and you can change it next time if something else comes to mind, but if you could have one significant impact in the world, what would it be? Wow. That's a uh, very deep. Um, I think for me, the, I guess kind of the under, like what underlines everything that I do um, and like the reason why I feel, I feel like I want to use like social media as like a, a tool to reach people um, is because I think people are capable of so much more than they initially believe. Um, and I think people sell themselves short a lot of times. And I know for in my own personal experience that I've done that to myself like time and time and time again. Um, and for me, it's to like be able to show people that like you don't have to be like an incredible talent. You don't have to be a phenom athlete to like or or like in their own whatever it is, that one thing in their own journey. I think for people, they should know and what I want to convey on to people is that if you work hard enough and you're passionate about something, you can make a career out of that. Um, I truly believe that the, the like direct and natural outcome of hard and passionate work is going to be some kind of financial compensation. You know, um, I think for myself, like, the ski industry is probably one of the most difficult industries to make a career. Uh, I feel like every year the budget is smaller. Every year um, athletes are utilized less. And like, I think that um, just being passionate about this thing for me and, and working hard to be an expert in what I'm doing. And for me, that really entails like, this journey as more of like an endurance based ski mountaineer, um, which isn't something that occurs overnight. That's something that like takes many, you know, years. But for me, I think that like, if you have the drive, if you have the passion for something, never sell yourself short on it. Like you can get paid to do that thing. Um, and if it's a, like a niche thing, like, even better because gonna you're going to be the only, you know, one of only a select few that can be like selected as an expert for that. And I think if you, for me, telling people that um, or showing people that like through like imagery or words, um, I think that's powerful for me. That's what I want to show people. If I can impact even one person to like, stop doing what it is that they do that they dislike doing um and, and realize like they could do more and like they could have a fulfilling life they don't have to make a million dollars to be fulfilled you know you can do something like make money through skiing and and like support yourself as well like i work at a restaurant uh three or four nights a week um you know like that's how i am able to support myself living in one of the most affluent and expensive places in the entire planet. Um, you know, like I would highly doubt like an athlete's salary would like truly ever allow me to like live where I live. Uh, and, and so like, but you never know. And I'm not going to sell myself short on it because it could be, it could be possible. And I think that, um, you know, I think for myself, like on a very deep level, 
uh, being passionate, having that, that drive, um, you know, that's allowed me to like have the support that I have to have gone on the trips that I've gone on to have had like some of the, uh, experiences that I've had and to like live in this more, in a, in a way that like makes me feel most fulfilled where I connect most with like a natural environment. And I think for somebody out there that might not be skiing, it could be like whatever, playing the guitar, it could be painting, uh, it could be like becoming a teacher uh, or working with, um, you know, underprivileged kids. I don't know exactly what it is for somebody else. But I think that if you put your like heart and soul into something, if you're really, truly passionate and you work all the time, like if you're working towards uh, continuing your progression in that thing, like you can make a career out of that. And I, I want people to know that, that that's absolutely possible. Boom. I couldn't have said it any better myself, man. So, so true. Dude, this conversation was amazing. Like, yeah, I enjoy it. I, it's nice to just talk, you know, not, not a whole lot of questions, but just to see where it all goes. Definitely. I prefer this style so much more. And this was actually probably one of my favorite conversations. So thank you so much. Like, Oh, thanks man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. There you have it, folks. That was honestly one of my favorite interviews. I enjoyed that conversation so much. And TJ and I plan on having another conversation here very soon in regards to his plant-based diet and routine, fitness, everything that he does to do the trail running, mountain races, and mountaineering that he does. Um, We will have a website up very shortly with all of these episodes, all of the show notes, all of the resources that you guys have been missing because of my bad. So thank you guys so, so, so much for listening. I appreciate each and every one of you guys uh, more than I can say. And as always, thank you so much for tuning in to The Athletic Stance. If you haven't checked it out, go check out The Athletic Stance on YouTube where I teach athletes how to become influencers and entrepreneurs. Until next time.